Um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this meeting of the Capitola City Council. It's good to see everyone in the audience and uh, all the staff that are here. And look at this, we have a full panel in presence <laughs> of the council members, yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's been a while. It's good to be here with all of you uh, in person. And so I'm going to begin this meeting of October 13th, 2022, 22, excuse me, of the Capitola City Council. And we'll start with um, roll call by our clerk. Council Member Brown. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Council Member Bertrand. Here. And Council Member Brooks. Here. Mayor Story. Here. Would everybody join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'll ask um, staff if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda. I just want to note that under the presentations, item 3B, um, our new front office person, Liliana Carosa, is not able to attend this evening, so we will be doing that at an upcoming meeting. All right, great. We look forward to a meeting here at uh, a future meeting. Um, but uh, Jessica is with us this evening, and we will be presenting that. Wonderful. Um, so um, with that, I think we'll go right into um, presentations. And the first one um, is, well, actually, I think I'll let you announce it, Nikki. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Um, I am here to present to you the winner for uh, Mayor for a Day essay contest in the elementary division, um, Desiree Adams. Yeah. I believe we're going to have her come on up and... Yes. Yes, we're all set. And, and before I get kicked out of my seat here, <laughs> Um, by a future council or uh, mayor. I do want to present her with this certificate of commendation and this which is proudly, pr proudly presented to Desiree Adams, City of Capitola, mayor for a day. She's the elementary school winner at St. Abraham's Classical Christian Academy, fourth grade. Congratulations, mayor for the day. Here's your gavel if you need it. If the audience gets out of hand, don't be afraid to use it. And uh, take your seat right here. Yay. And I will step aside. And there we go. Hi, my name is Desiree Adams. I'm nine years old. I'm in fourth grade, and I go to St. Abraham's Classical Christian Academy. If I were given a chance to become a mayor for one day in Santa Cruz County, I would turn the gas prices down to help the people and families who can't afford to pay, the, pay to fill their car up or truck. And some people who can't afford the gas have to walk every single day, and maybe sometimes kids have to walk to school and back every day. Maybe people can't afford to ride the bus or buy a bike. I'd make things a little cheaper just because kids and parents, families and people with or old age or anyone in need to have clothes and especially food. I'd find the best place for kids and families to live. Comforting people is great and especially orphans. Even if orphans don't have parents, we should never treat them different but instead comfort them, which is what I'll do when I'm mayor for a day. I'll go to some schools and go to different classrooms and put a basket for clothes, bas blankets, whatever really. All we need is for everyone to be comforted. I'd also make services to make our county more beautiful, safe, and clean. I'd also let kids go to school without a vaccination because all kids should get an education. Every single kid should. 
and maybe the people without money can't afford the vaccination, so they can't go to school. And that means no education, no learning. But every kid should at least get to experience learning, going to school, making friends, and interacting with other kids their age, and learning to give respect to grown-ups. So if I were mayor for a day, I would make things fair, especially for orphans or families going through hard times because of money. I'll keep our county clean and healthy, other than polluted and unhealthy, and try my best to help everyone, no matter the cost. Are there any questions? <laughs> You've got my vote. Yeah. I vote for you. Yeah. Good job. Next for presentations, introduction of new public works director, Jessica Kahn. Perfect. Photo before she yeah she leaves. Do you want it behind the bar? Yeah, let's put on behind okay. the bar. Okay. Okay. Yeah, main yeah. story yeah. next to her. In front. <laughs> I'm gonna move these chairs back around. Yeah. Yeah. Let everybody come around you. Yeah, we'll come around you. In between mm -hmm. the flags, it's better. Yeah. Oh, okay. great. Very nice. Okay. She's gonna one, be taller than two, me soon. Three. <laughs> and then we'll do one up like this. One. Before we move on to the introduction of uh, Jessica, um, I do want to say, uh, Desiree, you have a bright future in politics. I can already tell um, your platforms are very relevant, um, and I think that uh, there's something that resonates with all of us. So that is well done, a well done essay, and um, I encourage you to keep up your advocacy um, and your thoughts for how to serve the community. Thank you. So we have introductions now for uh, Jessica Kahn. Ms. Well, hi, C come right up. Mayor and Council, it's my pleasure to introduce our new Public Works Director. Uh, Jessica joins us after our previous Public Works Director of 20 years recently retired. Uh, Jessica brings more than 15 years of public sector work experience to Capitola. She's worked for cities throughout the Monterey Bay region, including Pacific Grove and uh, Scotts Valley, and most recently was the city engineer for the city of Monte Sereno. Jessica's had a really diverse background. She's had practical experience in all aspects of public works, including dealing with capital improvement projects, street maintenance, water treatment and distribution, uh, engineering, traffic and transportation development, project development, all kinds of different things. And then she's also uh, a California native and she attended Berkeley and got her bachelor's of science degree in nuclear engineering and then a master's degree in environmental uh, management from the University of San Francisco. So I really want to welcome Jessica to the team. We are really excited to have her join. It's been a whirlwind of a first week so far, but we are very, very ha mm -hmm. happy to have her on board. Hi, uh, just briefly, and it's very hard to follow you up, and it's also very hard to follow up Steve Jesberg. <laughs> um, <laughs> but good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, the Central Coast is a really special place. I've made it my home. I'm raising my family here. The city of Capitola in particular is a great place to explore and recreate and to live. And I'm just really looking forward to working with the great staff at the Public Works Department to, uh, just to make it what you guys want your community to be. Well, welcome, Jessica. On uh, behalf of the city of Capitola um, and all the council members, even though they may have some words of their own, I don't want to speak for them, but I think um, we're very lucky to have you. Sounds like your background and resume is extensive and that you have a lot of experience with uh, communities around the Monterey Bay. Um, and so I think that that's going to serve us very well. 
Um, and we all look very forward to working with you in the future. So, yes, thank you. Uh, any other council members want to say a few words or just say hi? And well, I'll say hi. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I'll, I'll say hi. So um, you're part of a tradition now. You may not realize that, but uh, um, a recent police chief was a Don, and I'm a former Don, and you are also. Oh, lovely. That means she went to USF as I did, and uh, Chief McDaniels also went there. So welcome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. In when it's okay. Um, well, uh, I mean, you're going to hear a lot from us. I'm yeah, sure. I believe so <laughs> I, we're just thrilled. I'm thrilled to have you and here and to see all of the great work to, to be done here in the city and to, to, to have you on board. So welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you and really excited to work with you and have you be a part of the awesome city of Capitola. Welcome. Welcome. We're really excited to have you here. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thank you. So next uh, on our agenda, we'll go to um, additional materials. Uh, do we have any additional materials this evening, Madam Clerk? None were received. Okay. Next is uh, oral communications. This is the um, opportunity for members of the public to address the City Council on items that are not on tonight's agenda or that are on tonight's consent agenda. Um, I mean, just so uh, we have a short consent agenda tonight, and those items, if anyone wants to speak to them, are to consider the minutes from the September 22nd, 2022 City Council meeting, um, approve the check registers from September 2nd to September 16th and September 30th, um, to approve a grant resolution for a Coastal Conservancy grant in the amount of $1,900,000 um, for the Capitola Wharf renovation um, and to consider a resolution allowing for the continuation of, of teleconferencing um, as we have been doing uh, um, during the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so those are the consent items. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to any of those or on any topic, this is your opportunity. Yes, I see some fellow Arts Commission commissioners coming Hello. up. My name is Roy Johnson. I'm the chairman of the Arts and Cultural Commission. Uh, and I'm here with Lori, uh, Lori Hill, a fellow commissioner. Um, we're here to uh, give you a little bit of a heads up on some up upcoming uh, projects we're uh, getting into. And uh, one of them is a, uh, you know, the Begonia Festival was a big event here for quite a long time, really identified uh, Capitola in a big way for a lot of people. And we were thinking as a commission that we could uh, establish some kind of a commemorative uh, public art piece. Uh, uh, somewhere in the village and so we set about uh, going around looking for a spot. Uh, the public art, uh, as I have learned and done a few, it's very long and arduous and uh, we wanted to come up and make sure that um, we were uh, uh, doing something that the community was going to get behind rather than get go through it all and then have it uh, uh, what were you thinking kind of thing. So um, uh, we've identified a spot uh, in uh, Capitola. Um, briefly, it's the spot uh, coming under the railroad trestle down uh, Capitola Road. There's a little grassy area. We're thinking that would be a perfect little spot for, uh, for that. And um, what the actual thing would be is part of the public art process. And uh, so uh, that remains to be seen, but we just wanted to, uh, if anybody had any uh, feedback or anything to say about uh, that, um, that would be appreciated in the beginning uh, of the process. Um, and then Lori wants to speak a little bit about the uh, upcoming Plan Air event. Thank you, Roy. I'm very proud to be standing up here with him. He's a, he's a great commissioner with a lot of experience and I've learned a lot. Uh, just to piggyback on what you started with with the Begonia Commemorative Art Project, 
Uh, this has obviously been in the works and thought about now for five years because the Begonia Festival ended five years ago, um, to which we paid tribute to it uh, just this last Labor Day weekend. But uh, we've identified a location. It's specifically at the corner of Stockton and Wharf Road. It's public property. It's, um, it's really at a key juncture that overlooks where the Begonia Festival um, took place with this nautical parade. And uh, every subcommittee member that, that I've met with um, keeps coming back to that location. And so that's our focal point. And uh, this item is not new to you because it was actually in our annual report of uh, planned activities um, that you received uh, during the summer. But we wanted to highlight it and let you know that the Art and Cultural Commission over the next couple months will be looking at a draft call to artists. Um, it'll be going out. Uh, and then the process will be that we'll receive uh, proposals from the artists and it'll go from there. Eventually, the project does come back to the council. But like Roy said, it's important for the council and the community that's listening tonight to know that this project is is underway and if they have any suggestions ideas or know any artists that they want to refer to us please do so so we're excited about it and, and excited to announce it and with that excitement to announce I just wanted to also add that Capitola plein air is coming uh, October 31st and the artists arrive on the 31st they check in plein air is an event that's been going on for over five years and uh, it is an Art and Cultural Commission uh, project. And we have anywhere from 30 to 40 artists that come to town that paint out of doors. That's what the word plein air means. And so here they are in October, uh, up to the very beginning of November, they're painting outdoors. Uh, we've had the whirlwind of weather during that period of time, but it's been a wonderful experience for the artists. And so you can come out and you can watch the artists at work. You can also uh, come down and to our meet and greet on Saturday where we kind of a cluster of the artists down at Capitola Beach, hoping to kind of get a little spin going on down there. And then on November 6th at Jade Street, we will have the exhibition, competition, and show and sale. Uh, and so at that location this year, we'll be at Jade Street Community Center and we will have uh, an opportunity for people to participate in an art project. We'll have um, all the artists and all the pieces of work that they produce. We'll have ribbons up for all the artists. All these pieces will be for sale. We'll have a small combo playing and a food truck. So please come out on November 6th and be a part of Capitola Plein Air. Appreciate that, and I have some marketing materials if you'd like a copy. Yes. Hey, Lori, what time will um, the event be at Jade Street? Thank you. Um, 11 to 4. 11 to 4. 11 to okay. 4. So everybody put it on your calendars and try to get by. You'll see some great art. And thank you, Roy. Thank you, Lori, for all the volunteer you work do to keep art alive uh, in Capitola. So You're a thanks. part of that as well, yeah. Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the audience um, that would like to address the council? Seeing none, I'll, uh, Chloe, is there anyone on the Zoom that? Um, I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll now move to staff uh, and city council comments. Um, are there staff comments? I think we have one comment this evening yeah. from our police chief. Chief, yeah. Good to see you. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Great, great. All right. Good okay. evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm sure you've seen our officers out on the street. They're, the hue of their uniform is a little bit different. It's pink for uh, October. Uh, it's the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I just wanted to present everyone with a patch for, for that. Um, we are selling those at the police department. All the proceeds go to uh, our police officers association that goes to a local uh, entity. So I gave one to the, the mayor that actually left, Let's and then see. I have these for you as well. So I'll hand <laughs> oh, over. well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other staff comments? None? Um, uh, city council comments. Yes, council member Brooks. Yeah, so I just learned that the chamber is going to be hosting their annual Halloween trick-or-treating parade on um, the, not on Halloween, on Sunday. 
Um, so everyone can meet in the parking lot at 1.30, and then the parade begins at 2 o'clock. And I'm seeing nods, so I think I'm right on that time. Um, and it's been a long time since we've been able to do it, so I'm really excited to see the community come out um, together again, and I hope to see all of you there. No? All right. Um, so uh, now let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, these are items that uh, I had mentioned earlier will be taken with one vote unless a council member would like to pull an item for further discussion. Any items, any request to pull? Yep. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve item seven, uh, consent items A through D. Okay. I'll second. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Council Member Brooks and seconded by Council Member Brown to approve the consent agenda. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes <laughs> unanimously. Now we'll move on to item eight, which is general government public hearings. Um, and before we get into item 8A, um, I do uh, want to announce uh, that um, uh, my wife uh, works for the Community Action Board, which is the subject of item 8A and item 8B. Uh, so I am going to recuse myself from both those items uh, and I'll turn the floor over to Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. Take it away, Katie. Okay. Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor and Council. Uh, before you this evening is an um, is the Community Development Block Grant COVID-19 Response Funding. Um, also joining me this evening is Paul Ashby from At Adams Ashby and Associates, who has been ma um, managing our grant funds for CDBG. He is available uh, via Zoom. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, just oh, there, a, he there, he <laughs> there he is, yeah. <laughs> so quick refresher on CDBG. Um, application requirements for CDBG is that we always hold a public hearing for any um, allocation of funds. We need to adopt, the city council has to adopt a resolution. And then whenever um, ap applying funds, you also have to utilize any available program income. So the city routinely gets program income when loans are paid off that were that were funded through CDBG monies. Um, what qualifies for a CDBG activity? We've gone over this before, but a quick reminder, we can utilize the money for public services such as food distribution, rental assistance, public facilities, housing for homeless and economic development. There's a lot of criteria built into each of these, uh, makes it hard to use some of, some of these programs. Um, but through our CDBG activities specifically related to COVID-19 is the topic tonight, um, we have provided food distribution, rental assistance programs, and also economic development grants. Um, what th th this slide goes over the awards and our current applications. So in, um, we were given two rounds of money um, through the state HCD, the first um, was through the CARES Act and there we had 88,000 in CDBG CV1 funds and 80,000 in program income. Um, all of that money went towards food services and uh, 20,000 of it went towards rental assistance and then in the CARES Act round two we got $320,000 and we also had a little more program income which was uh, utilized towards um, our economic development grants for our small businesses. Um, also, one item that is in process is our application for 2021 CDBG funds for a half a million dollars. We've gotten preliminary notification that we are getting awarded this money. Two out of the three contracts have come in for signatures so far, so we've got one more uh, announcement coming through for the uh, final approval, but so that's exciting, more money for these, for our organizations. I um, just want to go over how we've allocated the money in the past. 
Um, the money for food services has gone to Gray Bears, Second Harvest, and Community Bridges. Um, a portion of it was also allocated towards CAB, Community Action Board, for rental assistance and mortgage assistance tied to COVID-19. As soon as we um, allocated that money, the state took over the rental assistance and mortgage assistance program for COVID-19. And um, in working with CAB, eventually we, we came to a conclusion that we really don't, we, we should just depend on the state run program because um, we didn't want to run into a conflict with duplication of benefits. So at this time, um, I, I've highlighted on this slide the funding that we have available to reallocate. The other item, business assistance, we started off with grants. I think there, we had $7,500 grants available to all businesses. We were hoping to fund 36 businesses. In the end, um, we couldn't get enough businesses to qualify because there's so many restrictions uh, tied to this, this funding. So we ended up doubling the amount of the grants to $15,000. Uh, that being said, at the end of the day, we were able to spend 165,000 of that money and we have 104 left. We have the 20,000 left in CAB funding and we also have 44,000 uh, in program income from a loan that was paid off. So right, the purpose of the meeting tonight is to reallocate the funds, the 168, almost $169,000. Um, our suggestion is on this slide. Um, in the past, Second Harvest uh, has typically gotten a little more money than Gray Bears. This round, we're suggesting to give uh, Gray Bears a little more money than Second Harvest, kind of even out the numbers better. Um, and Second Harvest is still working through a portion of the, uh, the second round of funding, so they still have about 20,000 left there. Um, so we're suggesting in that center line, the proposed reallocation is about 50,000 to Gray Bears, 44,000 to Second Harvest, and then 75,000 to Community Bridges. Um, total funding is shown on the far right. Our pending 2021 CDBG award, the amounts that um, each of these entities, they, they told us what they would need in the next three years. Um, and it came just under 500,000 for our grant and then adding in our admin costs, it, it worked out perfectly for an application of half a million. So that pending award that will uh, fund these entities for three years is 52,000 to Gray Bears. Uh, 111,000 to Second Harvest, and then almost 300,000 to Community Bridges. So um, tonight, the recommended action is to adopt the three proposed resolutions authorizing the city manager to amend the current CDBG coronavirus response, which will reallocate the CDBG funding from rental assistance um, and business assistance to Gray Bears, Community Bridges, and allocate the program income to Second Harvest Food Bank. With that, Paul and I are both available for questions. Thanks, Amy. Do you, do you wanna go ahead, Jack? Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, so you made a statement in terms of, um, I think it was Second Harvest uh, allocated, uh, they hadn't gone through it yet. So can you explain how the money is dispersed? That's sort of the, my question. You don't do a lump sum, I gather. You give it as they use it and they give you a report. Can, can you just sort of elucidate what, what happens? That's correct. They, they will submit the, um, a request for reimbursement for the funding that they have utilized and it has to tie back to Capitola residents. So once they submit the request for reimbursement, Paul and I go through those requests and then we, um, we essentially um, issue a, a check to them and then we ask for a reimbursement through HCD. Is that a monthly or as they complete a program? Um, what's a time element there it, it, it isn't a set time it, it depends on when we get these requests in so okay um, mm -hmm. okay thanks yeah. Great. any other council questions okay going out to the public anybody on zoom Zoe I don't see any hands so okay, thank you thanks so we can take it back to council comments or a motion. 
Uh, I'll move to adopt the recommended action. Second. Great. We have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call? Council Member Brown. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Great. That takes us on to item 8B, the community, community grant 22 to 20, 2025 fund allocation uh, for the Community Action Board. And who, or it's Chloe's presentation. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So just really quickly, I need a second to get everything set sure, up. Sure, yeah. Uh, and to clarify, I'm doing three separate presentations all in a row. Right, okay. So, but it's just me. You're our gal, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I still need to share my screen here so that my slides show up on the big TV. Okay, and okay, yes? Yes. Good, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor and Council. I'm actually really excited about these items. This is the first time I've been able to participate in this um, as part of my role here, so thank you. Um, we're starting off um, with one specific application because of um, some recusals that had to take place. So just as a reminder, um, our City of Capitola Community Grant Program, um, I think I'm at the end of my slideshow here. <laughs> no wonder I was confused. Okay, thank you. So an overview of the whole program, um, to recap basically, uh, Council approved updates back in May to the overall program. Uh, those included creating three specific grant categories based on um, that were prioritized stable affordable housing health and wellness and healthy environments and also created two different grant types and that that was based on how much money for what type of grant so there were outcome grants that have a range of funding um, between $7,500 and $15,000, and then the operational grants go up to the $7,500. And there's a couple different res um, requirements of an outcome grant, one being that the program benefits the city directly and that the organizations will present to council um, about their program and how it, how it has helped the community. Um, other updates, there's a very significantly streamlined application. Uh, I did hear from several applicants that were actually kind of shocked by how easy it really was. So that's great news. Uh, there's a th now a three-year grant cycle. So the next time new applications will be accepted is summer in 2025. And in this year, so this fiscal year, uh, council allocated $125,000 from the general fund towards grants. And then separately, $60,000 for early childhood and youth programming grants. Now, this is just specific, again, to the one application from the Community Action Board. And like I said, it's being considered separately because of some remote interests. And the uh, CAB, as we call it, they applied for a $15,000 stable affordable housing outcome grant. So you'll remember that's one of the um, categories is stable affordable housing and then outcome is the type of grant. And um, as I should have mentioned already, council also created the subcommittee to review all applications, which are um, of course, council member Brown and vice mayor Kaiser and the subcommittee recommended allocating $10,000 to cab for this grant um, cycle. So really that's what I have to say about this one. Um, you can you know, move on from there and then we'll we'll just keep going. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Come. We'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Any fr anybody from the public questions or anybody on Zoom? Let uh, that's me again. So let me stop sharing and check. I see a hand. Great. And I'm gonna allow Alyssa to talk. Go ahead, Alyssa. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council Members. I am Alyssa Sanchez, Community Action Board Program Coordinator of the Homelessness Prevention and Intervention Services Department. 
We are grateful to be recommended for the 2022 to 2023 community grant funding for the CAP grant assistance program. As you know, CAP has been a um, designated nonprofit anti-poverty agency for over 55 years with rental assistance programming for over 35 years. During this time, we've had a long-standing partnership with the city of Kakapua to provide rent assistance to avoid eviction and homelessness for the most vulnerable residents, including low-income families with children, as well as senior and disabled households. Typically, households come to us needing assistance due to changes in family composition, job loss, unexpected medical or other critical household expenses. In 2022 to date, CAB's RAP has assisted four capital households benefiting 13 people, including five adults and eight children. If approved for the recommended proposal amount tonight, we would expect to serve an additional three to four households this year. To show you an example of the impact your funding partnership has on vulnerable capital households, we'd like to share a client story with you. RAP recently assisted a Capitola senior who was dealing with a work injury and had a gap in workers' compensation assistance. Her expenses were very limited and she was utilizing food banks and public transportation. She was relieved and grateful that our program was able to assist her with two months of rent assistance to cover this gap in order to avoid an eviction. Thank you for your continued support and collaboration to help vulnerable Capitola residents stay safely housed. For more information about CAB's rental assistance program for Capitola residents, please contact us at 831-457-1741. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no more. Okay. Thank you. Any comments? I just have a quick comment. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as Alyssa mentioned, uh, CAB has been assisting um, Capitola residents during this pandemic with rental assistance and eviction, uh, eviction prevention. Um, I know they do really important work, not just in Capitola, but throughout the county. Um, I'm an unpaid board member uh, on the Community Action Board, and I've heard uh, throughout the pandemic the stories of people needing additional assistance than we've ever seen before in our, our agency. So um, I feel like it's really important uh, that this funding be provided so that they can continue to do that, that important work. Thank you. I agree. Anything else, or do we have a motion? I'll move the recommendation. Okay. I'll second. Thank you. All right. We got a motion and a second. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. And Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, that passes unanimously, and we can welcome back Mayor Story. And Vice Mayor, I'm gonna excuse myself for the next item. Oh, sorry, thank you. You got it. Why? Sure. Um, so I'm currently a board member for the uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and so I'll be recusing myself from item 8C this evening. tagging in and out. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. It's a sign of active um, <laughs> council members in our community. So now let's then move on to item 8C, which is the community grant 2022-25 fund allocations to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. The recommendation is to consider uh, the recommendation of the Community Grant Subcommittee to award the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation $5,000 from the general fund and $7,500 from the early childhood and youth programming funds as part of the community grant program. So who's going to give the staff report? That's me. Hi, oh. Mayor Story. Welcome back. Thank you again, everyone. Um, so I'll just go over, I, again, just kind of the quick overview so the mayor can hear. Um, as you know, you approved changes to the program in May. There are three new grant categories listed here on the screen and two different grant types based on how much funding the, the applicant is asking for. Um, outcome is a range between 7,500 and 15,000, and then operational is up to 7,500. Um, Okay, great, I, okay. So 
for in this particular item, we're talking, as you mentioned, about the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, it's being considered separately because of remote interests, as we know. And this is a little bit unique because they applied for two grants, which is absolutely great. Um, one was an operational grant for healthy environments, so actually our only applicant for that category, incidentally. And then an operational grant, as you mentioned, from the Early Childhood Youth Programming Fund. So. Um, I was going to talk about this in the next item a little more, but there there was no specific amount indicated, which was actually quite common. We believe due to the fact that the new two grant types sort of specify an amount of funding. So that's why um, the recommendation here really follows those ranges. As you can see, the subcommittee recommended allocating $5,000 out of the general fund, so for the Healthy Environment Grant application, and then $7,500 for um, out of early childhood and youth programming for the, the kid grant <laughs> that they applied for. So that's some background there. And again, um, I'll let you discuss. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so are there um, any members of the public that would like to address the council on the grant to uh, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary? Seeing none. Is there anyone on the Zoom? I don't see any hands. No hands? Okay. I'll bring it back to the council for discussion and, uh, and action. So, yes, Council Member Bertrand. Yes. Um, so maybe to the individual here representing the team and Kristen. So what is the um, Operational Healthy Environmental Grant? What specifically is that? We had uh, three types, uh, three categories of grants. Healthy environment was one of the categories. And then we had two types of grants, operational and outcome. outcome thank you. Um, and so the categories were just, what are you going to be spending this money on? So envir healthy environments was what they were going to be spending, the category of what they would be spending their money on. And then um, uh, the operational grants are essentially grants that are going to help cover the day-to-day -day operations of the program and an outcome-based grant, uh, as, as Chloe mentioned, would require them to come to council and tell us the outcomes that are actually going, we, we will be expecting from the funding that they received from us. So calling it a, an operational healthy environments grant, it, that's not a separate grant from anything else we're doing. It's just putting the category of grant and the type of grant together in one sentence. Okay. So basically it's day-to-day -day operation. An operational well, grant was up to $7,500, so we considered it to be es essentially for the day-to-day -day operations. Okay, that, that's basically the same thing they applied for last time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't remember, I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me for the exact amount that they got last Grant no, cycle. I, just I remember the same what it was for. Thing. That's all. Yeah. yeah. That's my point. Mm -hmm. Oh, for the same program. Yes. yes. Same. Yeah. It just wasn't called that then. Right. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Last last time we did this, we didn't have categories of of grants the way we had now. It was just kind of a free for all, and so that was part of the overhaul of our grant uh, system was determining the priorities in our community based on that community profile that we had the. Um, the, the consultants. consultants, thank you. The consultants uh, help us with, and then once we determined those priorities, we created these categories um, for people to ask for funding to address. Right. Did they specify what th their outcomes would be within the Healthy Environments Grant? So this wasn't an outcome grant, it was an operational grant, so I don't think they had to tell us exactly what the outcomes would be, though each of the grant applications, if I remember correctly, had um, a section where they would tell us, you know, the good work that they're doing and how this money would continue to help them do those good works. Um, but because it wasn't an outcome specific grant, um, they didn't need to tell us exactly what outcome there would be from this funding. Um, but I mean, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation does a lot of really good work in general. You know, we're, we're very privileged to live on a National Marine Sanctuary and it takes a lot of work um, from organizations like the foundation um, to to gather the funding and do the advocacy and whatnot that we need to maintain this pristine environment that we uh, happen to live on. All right, thank you. Um, any further discussion about the recommendation? 
Oh, yeah, I have some discussion. So um, I spoke up last time when this came up, you know, when the first uh, recommendations was made. And my point at that time, because I read all the grants very carefully, and my point was focused on this is operational. Um, and then the other point I made at that time was that you know, I prefer to have things directly benefiting the residents of Capitola, noting that there's many other organizations around in this area that, um, Capitola in particular, that work with kids or work on environmental issues. And so I voted for it last time because there would be a report on what they use the money for, and I haven't seen that report, um, so I'm a little dismayed. But I have no problem with early childhood youth programming grant. I think that's excellent. But this organization, I don't think, needs our money as much as the residents of Capitola need our money to support things. And um, in environmental or in other areas. So I can't, I can't support the first part. I could support the operational early grant youth grant program. And I wouldn't mind adding both together so that the youth get 12, seven and five, yeah, 12. 1250. So that I would put that out there as, an, as a recommendation change and make that as a motion. Um, so there's a motion on the floor to combine uh, the total s amount of $12,500 uh, and put it all toward the early childhood youth programming a component of this grant. Right. Do I hear that motion correctly? Correct. Okay, is there a second? Seeing no second, um, the motion dies um, for the lack of a second. Um, just going, um, th they, uh, this is a three-year grant cycle, as I understand it. Um, will they be reporting annually on uh, the outcomes? No, this isn't an outcome grant, so they don't have oh, well, to report to the council. They don't report at all on our to staff on until the end of the three years? So the intent behind the operational grants, and we haven't, this is the first time we've rolled them out, was that there really wasn't very much reporting back required. It was the outcome grants where we were gonna be expecting a presentation during the grant period from the recipients to the city council at a meeting. Yeah, so you know, my point earlier when we discussed this was, you know, there's so many programs here in Santa Cruz in this particular area. I definitely um, agree with you, Kristen, that you know we're privileged to be in this area, sanctuary. And um, but when we collect money from taxes and grants and other program sources, my my job is to make sure that things go directly to the residents of Capitola. Um, so I put that out there, and um, I was promised a report on what they would do. I had read their application very carefully, and they were just using it for operational, you know, normal things to run an office. Uh, I have not seen a report, and even though that was promised, um, it wasn't made by them, but it was made by, well, we were gonna ask for it. I can't remember how that transpired. So, um, you know, I'm willing to change in that I know that if we combine, it'll be for early childhood youth programming, and they'll come up with some other way to make sure that the, the staff and, and operations are, are run correctly on a daily or whatever basis they run it on. But I, I just don't have any say of how they use that money, and I would expected it, but. Um, if I could, if I could just jump in for just a second, and um, I'll ask our city attorney to stop me if I'm going out of bounds of the lines of this agenda item, but I just want to make it clear that as we move forward in the agenda tonight with other grants that we're going to be looking at, there are multiple operational grants, and none of them will have to report to us. So this is not um, anything specific to this organization. That just this organization doesn't have to report back to us. None of our operational grant recipients have to report back to us, and that's not really that much different from what we've seen in the past from from any of our um, uh, grant recipients. Um, I'm pretty sure no one has ever been required to have they ever been required to come report to us, or some of them just chose to, or we asked them to in the past. 
So historically, there has been, I believe it was twice a year, reports that we would receive. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say whether or not, I, I know that the staff would receive them. They were not transmitted to council. Mm -hmm. And in the distant past, we did go through a year where we tried to invite every recipient to make a presentation at the beginning of every meeting. Um, it filled up the agenda, as you can imagine, pretty, pretty heavily. So in general, the practice has not been to require the presentation to council. So this would be a new thing moving forward, that requirement. Yeah, and that's for the operational grants. So I just, again, I don't want to get too far out of this agenda item, but I wanted to make it clear that the Marine Sanctuary Foundation is not required to present to us, but none of our um, operational grantees will be required to present to us. Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. Thanks. So over the years, um, even starting when I was on the Finance Advisory Board, I've listened to multiple uh, reports on the various organizations that we've given money to, and they're very willing to tell us what they do because um, they want that uh, information imparted to the community, and this is one of the best ways to do that. Um, I understand that this is an easier way. Um, I've been on the AAA Advisory Board and listened to many discussions about how these grants present a lot of onerous issues for you know just putting the paperwork together. Um, so I, I could see this operational grant doesn't require a, um, a report, but my point goes back to when we originally initially gave some money to the sanctuary group, and I was expecting something to come back this time. Nothing did. I, but the main point I have is voting for operation I'm not so keen on that, but voting for a program that I know benefits um, this area, but um, not for operations. So, you know, that's the reason why I, I can't vote for the first part, and I'm offering a, a, a compromise here um, so that we just combine both funds for the, the children's program. I, I could see a benefit there. Um, part of our discussion initially was this is great for children, so I could see putting the 12-5 for children, but not necessarily directly for operations. Um, okay. Mr. Mayor, um, Mayor Story, do th the motion that was on the floor is dived for lack of a second, so it's open for a motion at this time, am I correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, move forward with the subcommittee recommendation of $5,000 grant from the general fund and $7,500 grant from the Early Childhood Youth Program. I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second, and uh, before I call for a roll call vote, um, I think um, I just want to speak uh, on behalf of, of uh, nonprofit organizations um, having general uh, administrative funds. Um, you know, every organization, you know, they, they have their uh, administrative responsibilities and tasks that they need to carry out. Many of them are indirect. Uh, but they are foundational and I think fundamental to their ability to carry out their particular objectives. Um, so, you know, they're um, having um, some funding directed toward that, I think makes for a good uh, uh, and well run and administrative and, and really transparent organization. Um, and with that said, I, I, I think it is incumbent upon us and the staff to you know, keep an eye on these uh, and make sure uh, that periodically that they are uh, meeting their objectives. Um, you know, we do have a huge in investment or stake in, in the Monterey Bay, um, and they're going to be our partners, um, um, you know, in, in keeping it um, clean, healthy, and safe for the residents of Capitola. So that's just, um, with that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Brown. Aye. Um, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. No. Mayor, uh, Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes three to one. Now we'll move on to uh, item D, which is the uh, community grant 2022-25 fund allocations. I believe so. Um, we can bring. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll get set up.
Welcome back. So just to um, uh, start over on item 8D, uh, which is the community grant 2022-25 fund allocations, the recommended action is to consider the community grant subcommittee grant award recommendations for program applications, excluding the requests from the Community Action Board and the Monterey Bay National Brain Sanctuary Foundation. So, and Chloe, you're leading in this again? Yes, Please. thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, thank you, um, Council. We're gonna quickly go over the program, um, over the changes to the grant program now that you're all together, and then we'll move forward in some more um, information. So you did, back in May, as you recall, approve um, changes to the program, three new grant categories um, listed here, and we'll talk about those more in a few seconds, and two grant types based on the amount of funding, an outcome grant that you'll see is a larger um, sum, 7,500 to 15,000. There is a requirement of a report back to council by that organization if they're given an outcome grant, and operational for money up to $7,500. There was a very streamlined application. Like I mentioned, and I'll say again, one of those streamlining <laughs> may have been slightly too streamlined, and um, several of our applicants did not indicate actually a dollar amount that they were asking for. They just checked, understandably, they checked a box which type of grant outcome or operational. So we re we're, we'll make that update for the next go around. Uh, the three-year grant cycle, so in summer 2025, we'll have a slightly updated application and people will be able to apply again. And for this fiscal year, the fund allocation approved is 125,000 out of the general fund and 60,000 for um, early childhood and youth programming. And those grants, as you'll see later on, are separated, the applications are separated. So. Applications were due on August 15th. We received 24 applications from 23 different organizations. Um, I was very excited to see that there were two totally first time applicants, so two new organizations, and seven of those were for early childhood and youth program funding. And as you also know, council appointed Vice Mayor Kaiser and Council Member Brown to the subcommittee to review the applications and make the recommendation. So now we'll get in to the fun information. The priorities, okay, was very fascinating to me. The three priorities were given funding priority. So as you'll see in the top chart, for stable affordable housing, um, that was considered most important. You gave that half of the funding. Health and wellness received 30% in, priori in priority, and then healthy environments, 20%. Well, as you can see, the difference in those in those charts the applications that were actually received really were different in in what people applied for what organizations were asking for so 81 percent we had 13 health and wellness applications only one healthy environment that was just approved and two for stable and affordable housing so just kind of keep that in mind as we go through this very interesting and if i'm not overstepping the subcommittee that is with you here, their goals were to allocate the funding, all, all available funding to be allocated to, applica to applicants and to fund applicants to the highest that, that possibly could be and to meet the need that was really shown in our community through our applications. So taking it back to how the applications really did, how it shook out, what type of grant did people really apply for while maintaining the prioritized categories because we know that those are important to all of council. So here's a fun chart. Um, I'm realizing it's still very small for, all, for you sitting there to see that on the screen. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Basically, you'll see here, um, I'll just say a few things. The two, new, the two newbies, the applications are green with a blue circle and mid, the Mid-County Senior Center. And um, the two blue here are the, the organizations that already, their funding was approved in the two previous items, and that's why that's blocked off here. Uh, this green column is what the subcommittee recommended funding everyone. You'll notice everybody's getting funding um, on September 8th. So 
maybe the city manager can give me some advice here on if if everyone can see this. <laughs> um, if I should go through line by line, I'd be happy to um, verbally state the amount that's recommended for each applicant. So I think it's up to the council. Okay. We we can we can go through it. I can potentially share my screen up on the um, as just the spreadsheet. And that might can they see it on Zoom? I think that's what's important because we have it in our packet. Yeah, I think the Zoom participants will be able to see it quite easily because they're sitting, I can see it easily on that Zoom screen right there. So I think the Zoom participants can see the amounts. Right. Is it on the screens up here? It is on the screens, okay. although I imagine it's a little bit challenging to read. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we see if um, uh, council members have questions about any particular applicant or a particular grant? Um, and then when it comes time for public comment, we can uh, respond to any questions that we get. Okay. Um, so uh, are there questions? Uh, yeah, C go ahead, Council Member Brooks. Um, the, the recommendation it was made on September 8th. Is that what that means? I got it. Okay. Um, and just to confirm, this is for three years, and so we can revisit because the, the, the graphs were really in fascinating. And so council has the opportunity to revisit that in 30 years yes. um, based off of need. I just wanted to seek that clarification. Yes. Those are all my questions, thank you. Okay. Then, well, you guys were on the committee, yeah. so you, are, you have all the answers. Um, <laughs> and then I did uh, want to ask about um, Blue Circle. Mm -hmm. That's um, one I'm unfamiliar with. Um, just a little bit about maybe what mm -hmm. they do, how they serve or will serve Capitola, and how they fit into a health and wellness category. Sure. So from memory, th that is an organization that is around um, promoting a healthy wage, a living wage for the ca you know anyone in the county and certainly residents in the city. I don't want to talk too much. I, I think, I, yes, there's someone um, in the public who can speak more to that. Um, we did notice health and wellness got the most applications and you know council can draw their own conclusions it may be a, a lot of different things as you can imagine fit into health and wellness so that may be an explanation okay yeah um well maybe um when we go to public comments um yeah if you could come up then and respond to it but let's see if there's any other council um Questions? It doesn't look like there is. Um, uh, the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County, they're under health and wellness, um, and uh, that's an operational uh, grant. Um, and I wonder what in their application um, were they proposing to do in Capitola, seeing as that we have our own Arts Commission? So, again, from my memory, I don't know that there was anything super specific to Capitola. Um, Countywide, I know they did mention, uh, it's actually happening this weekend, my mother is participating, um, uh, Open Studios, and uh, some of their other bigger programs that the Arts Council puts on um, that we may be familiar with. And um, the, the one with the acronym NAMI, Santa Cruz County? Name. It's a uh, it's a mental health uh, yeah. national, national alliance of yes. wellness. Is that what it is? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I believe our police department works relatively closely with NAMI, so they might be able to provide more information if you would like. Yeah, yeah, if you if you could, Chief, um, if you have some familiarity with uh, National Association of Mental Illness, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, excellent. Um, and um, are, are you, I mean, are you able to rely on them to uh, respond to mental health crises or issues uh, in our community? They're, they're not on the first response. I think they're more of an advocate for, for, for service. For, right. And so we work with them as, as we transition with the, with the, but yeah, they're not as the first response. Okay. More of a resource. All right, all right. Thank you. So, um, Chief? So my understanding, I've gone to a number of their meetings, um, involves the families of people who have children or family members that 
have mental health issues. And so I think that is part of it. And they give, um, they give talks, and that's how I happen to go to some of their meetings. So, yeah, okay. Okay, um, those are the ones that I had questions about. Uh, if there are no other questions from council, um, I'll now go out to the public and see if uh, members of the public could address the council on. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, good evening. With council's permission, I did bring some a presentation of sorts, not that you needed it, but it's got information about the agency that I'm representing today. Is that okay if I pass this off? Yes. Great, yes. thank you. Give it to the clerk and she'll give it to us. And one for each of you. Uh, good evening again. My name is Stephen Matzi. Uh, I am the long-term care ombudsman program coordinator for Santa Cruz and San Benito counties under the agency of Advocacy, Inc., which you'll note in the uh, funding recommendations we have been recommended for funding. So I'm here for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first of all, to introduce myself to council, I have not spoken before you, at least not in this role. Uh, many years ago, I worked with Senior Network Services, which is another agency recommended for funding. Um, so in gratitude for the staff's uh, recommendation of funding for our, our program, um, we are uh, mandated by the federal government through the Older Americans Act to provide advocacy and protection for long-term care residents, older adults living in skilled nursing, or assisted living facilities, which includes the 99-bed skilled nursing facility here in the city of Capitola. It's also important to know that while your city of Capitola residents may not end up in that particular facility, they could end up in any number of facilities within the county of Santa Cruz that we oversee. Um, I'm appreciative of the work that we get to do and the partnership that we can build with the city of Capitola to ensure that we protect the most vulnerable of our citizens and those are those living long-term in skilled nursing facilities. If we've learned nothing over the last two years is the pandemic wreaked havoc on our residents here in Santa Cruz. In fact, a report published by that Santa Cruz Lookout uh, indicated 72% of all deaths related to COVID-19 were individuals living in long-term care. Um, we were also locked out of those facilities for at least the first year and a half of the pandemic. And what we're finding now is a greater need, a greater need of individuals who were previously houseless, now living long-term, individuals with mental health challenges, um, individuals that have no social support, and we may be the only connection between the facility staff and the outside community. Um, the, what I provided to you today is just a snapshot of what we did with the two and a half ombudsmen we have to oversee 1,800 plus beds in our community. Um, so I hope you do take an opportunity to look at that um, and to really digest the amount of work that we do with the short resources that we have. So the funding recommended for our agency will go a long way for us to continue those advocacy efforts that are indeed the most essential within the community of City of Capitola and the, San the County of Santa Cruz and San Benito. Thank you very much for your time. And again, I appreciate the recommendation for funding. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, we have a question from Council Member Bertrand. Excuse yeah. me. So, Stephen Matsy, hopefully I'm pronouncing the name correctly. You are. It was great meeting you the other day. Thank you. And with this presentation, it seems to me um, you use volunteer in the community. Is um, that true? That is a good point and a wonderful aspect of the program. However, most of the volunteers that work with this program are older adults themselves. We've lost all of our volunteers because of the COVID pandemic. Um, I recently just had a volunteer who was one of our older olds, just about to turn 90, who had to decertify because of health challenges. So while volunteerism is an important aspect of this program and it will continue to be so, as I mentioned earlier, the, challenged, the challenges we're seeing in the facilities with the individuals that we're meeting, those with diagnosis of schizophrenia or addiction, really require a more seasoned and I hate to say degreed individual and our senior volunteers are absolutely perfect for general facility visits to monitor to be not friendly visitors because that's not what our mandate is but to be that connection and then hand that off to a staff ombudsman like myself or the other one and a half so we are volunteer less in the moment 
but we anticipate that changing at the beginning of the year. Let's get through this next flu and potential COVID outbreak season because we're still living the pandemic in these facilities, folks. Even though our, our leaders are saying the pandemic is over, it's, it's not for me and it's not for our residents. So thank you for your question, Councilman Bertrand. Thanks for coming. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Any other questions? No questions, but just wanted to reach out, say thank you for standing up today and for the work that you do. Thank you. My business card is attached to the information. Stephen, if people wanted to volunteer, how would they find out about that? Uh, call the number on my card, 831-429-1913, extension 15. I'll be happy to have conversation. It's, an, it's a rigorous training, 36 hours. Um, and 10 hours of shadowing inside a facility with a, a staff ombudsman and 18 hours annually of required continuing education. So it's it's a lot, it's a lot, but we take it at a, a slow pace and meet them where they're at in their volunteerism. Thank you. All right. You're welcome, Good. thank you again. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, yes. Please come up. State your name. My name is Alexander Peterson. I'm president of the nonprofit organization Blue Circle. Um, hello, Mayor Story and the rest of the council. Uh, Blue Circle provides certification to businesses who pay all of their employees a living wage, um, which we hope to encourage businesses um, to offer a living wage by creating economic incentive to do that. Um, by capturing a greater market share of ethical consumers similar to the green business program. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about okay. that? Do council members have questions? So um, that incentive, what, um, in, in essence, by certifying particular businesses, you're trying to drive the consuming market or customer more yes. to those exactly. particular businesses yeah and okay. another important aspect of blue circle is just creating more awareness of what a living wage is um which we break down by county mm -hmm. how many participating businesses do you have currently? we currently have four okay um in close to a year and a half uh -huh. since launching but we're really finding initial funding at this point in time and working on key partnerships, one being with the California Green Business Program. Okay, and and your your um, your kind of strategic plan uh, includes to build out within uh, Capitola. Oh yes, definitely. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll go out to Zoom and see if there's any member. Oh, oh yes, come right up. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. My name is Tracy Weiss. I'm the executive director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. I believe many of you have seen my predecessor stand before you previously, but you have not, I have not had the opportunity to address the council before, and I just wanted to take the moment to introduce myself and say thank you for the opportunity and the consideration to be included in the funding recommendations for this evening. Um, hopefully you're aware the O'Neill Sea Odyssey provides hands-on marine education for youth. We really are designed to be teaching youth about the marine environment right here in our backyard, providing this program for free, trying to inspire the next generation of ocean stewards and environmental advocates. Um, we are honored and thankful for all of the years of previous funding and are thankful for the opportunity to submit a more expanded, robust proposal to you tonight to expand not only to be serving the traditional classrooms, but working to support out-of-school time and enrichment activities for youth and the environment here in Capitola. So um, I just wanted to take a brief moment and say thank you for your consideration and just to say I'm looking forward to working with all of you going forward. So appreciate your time this evening thank you Tracy for yep. coming out and introducing yourself and uh, um, it's really good to see somebody uh, carrying on the legacy of Dan Hapley absolutely he was a force within our community uh, with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey and and all the the work that they did with the youth so uh, it's good to meet you absolutely uh, those are some big shoes to fill but we're gonna be doing some great well, things for I'm sure I'm sure you will <laughs> all right thank you thank you um, is there anyone else in the audience before I go out to the uh, Zoom participants? Okay, so I see two hands, and Eduardo, I'm going to allow you to speak. Go ahead when you're unmuted. 
Hi, good evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, so, yes, my name is Eduardo Santana. Um, thank you for uh, letting me uh, speak to all of you tonight. I'm the program director for Project Scout um, uh, under the umbrella of the Seniors Council of Santa Cruz and San Benito County. Uh, Project Scout provides free tax services for seniors, disabled, low-income families, and individuals in the city of Capitola, and have done so for many years. I want to thank you for your consideration of our community grant request, and I want to provide you a quick example of the work that we are doing for our Capitola community. Uh, we're helping a senior Capitola resident who supports her disabled son and grandkids, both are her dependents. Uh, with the help of Project Scout, she is to receive over $11,000 from the IRS and the Franchise Tax Board. This amounts to about a third of her income for the whole year. In order to prove that she qualifies for such credits, Project Scout volunteers have met with her on various occasions, settling over four hours of volunteer work so she can prove dependency of her son and grandkids to the IRS. When asked, our clients said that this money will go to make repairs for her mobile home, food, and clothes, amongst others. Beyond the massive benefit that this one capital resident and her family um, will get, Project Scout has assisted at least 135 Capitola taxpayers for the year with tax-related needs. On average, each of our clients assisted with tax preparation saves uh, on average $220 for each return and receives $1,221 in refunds. According to the Brookings Institution, refunds and credits received through taxes such as the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit are some of the country's most successful anti-poverty tools and the estimates show that the multiplier effect in California is at least twice the amount for local economies through reinvestment of such taxpayer refunds. We at Project Scout are proud of being part of such a uh, mechanism for maintaining health and wellness and financial equity. With your kind support, Scout will continue providing services to seniors, disabled and low-income families and individuals in Capitola. I truly appreciate the chance to speak tonight on Project Scout's behalf, and I want to thank you again for your continued support and allowing me to speak to you tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you for your work with the seniors. Um, and, and just to clarify, is Project Scout under the Seniors Council? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, um, so we have one more hand. Christina, I'm going to allow you to speak. Go ahead when you're unmuted. Hi, yes, I'm Christina Thurston. Uh, I work at the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County. Can you all hear me? Yes, Christina, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, the Volunteer Center, we also applied for funding through the Community Grants Program, and just want to thank you tonight for your continued support um, and consideration for funding this year. The funds that you contributed to our programs last year were essential for us in reopening our programs after COVID. And over the past couple of years through COVID and the 2020 fires, we experienced an incredible surge of interest in volunteering. And it's been inspiring to see how people are eager to contribute to our community, especially now as nonprofits and schools are struggling to fill vacancies. Um, as you likely know, <laughs> screening, training, and overseeing volunteers requires resources that few people are willing to fund. Um, and by making this one contribution to our programs and the operational support fund, we can dis sustain our existing services to over 400 Capitola residents and reach our goal of recruiting 500 volunteers who will contribute over $100,000 in donated labor to our communities within Capitola. Um, I know that We've been around for 50 years, and so many of you probably know a lot about our different programs. Um, but this year, we launched a new program called Wellness Connect. And the program supports youth aging out of the foster care system, providing ongoing mental health services and practical life resources to the vulnerable population. Most of that funding comes through Medi-Cal billing, but there's a lot of restrictions about what you can bill. And so that's where, again, the operational support funding really helps with leveraging those existing funds and grants that we have to make sure that we're able to keep supporting and, and growing our, our resources for the community. So 
Um, oh, I did also just want to say that we really value your, your commitment to funding as many programs as you can and really trying to spread the, the resources that you do have amongst the community programs. Um, we lowered our request this year because we wanted to make sure that you could still fund as many programs as possible, knowing that you have less funding available for this cycle. So thank you again for your support of all of the programs. All right, thank you, Christina. Is there anyone else? I don't see any more hands. Thank you. Okay, I will bring the item back to council for uh, further deliberation and action. Yes. Would you like me to put the chart back up? Yes, that, okay. that, that may be helpful. And there was another page with the youth funding, so <laughs> we don't want to miss that. So, Chloe, I think it might be possible to get rid of the camera view, which might be helpful in this situation. And the trick is, as you click on the, go up to the top of your screen. Of Zoom. Of Zoom. Okay. And there should be the three. More. Three buttons or something. And you yes. want to click optimize for video, video clip or something. Sorry, I've never done this before, but I was just trying to Google it. I, okay, so I clicked it. It is checked. It seems like it's high def, but not. <laughs> oh, it doesn't. I, I don't see it doesn't say yeah. optimize for high video panel, maybe. Okay. I saw it there. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry about this. No, this is great. Um, well, I, I, everyone who's on Zoom is Let's able see. to. Yeah, it's just this. us in the room. That and, have more yeah. yeah, and I think why don't we wait and see if maybe okay. we need it in more detail. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, and so um, with that, I'll bring it back to see the will of the council. I have some comments, if that's okay. Please. Yeah. So, um, you know, this has been a long process and I just want to say hats off to council for really um, for taking this project on it, it's been a long time coming um, and so being here today I'm just really happy to see this process um, come to fruition work for the community and here we are today about to approve three-year community grants and it's really something um, for the entire council to be proud of today. So um, hats off to our subcommittee members and previous council members who kicked us off, gosh, when I started in 2018, um, and I'm sure it was prior to then that this conversation started. So I'm just really excited to see this um, move forward. I also wanted to mention that the, uh, the dedicated children's fund, and I, I don't know if I heard this today, um, if it was just highlighted that it, it is in fact a separate fund that comes from our TOT tax. Mm -hmm. um, so I just don't know if that was noted, um, uh, which means that it does not come from our general fund, it comes from our transient occupancy tax and is a fund that essentially, hopefully over time will grow even more with, um, with people coming and staying at our hotels and, and us collecting um, the TOT taxes on that. And so that's my hope for the future there. Um, with that being said, I'd like to make a motion to approve this item. Um, and I would like to, if there's an actual recommendation that I could read, because I don't see it here, Chloe. Um, I just want to make sure I get it right. Do you have Absolutely. So I, I don't have that included. Okay. Well, I'm going to go for it then. <laughs> Yes. Do I see it? It's Recommended up. action. Um, so I'd like to move uh, to consider the community grant subcommittee grant award recommendations for program applications, excluding the grant request from the Community Action Board and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. So I think the action would be f to approve. I approve. I would like to approve the community grant subcommittee 
grant award recommendations for program applications, excluding the grant requests from the Community Action Board and the Monterey National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. I'll second. So we have, yes. Let's <coughs> We had a motion in a second. I just wanted to make sure I had a chance to make some comments before we vote. Oh, um, certainly. I think you could do that now. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, again, um, echoing what Councilwoman Brooks just said, this has been a very long process that goes uh, back to previous councils as well. I know Councilmember Botorf was a part of this at one point. Nearly every single one of us has been a part of a subcommittee or a consideration. We had... Um, consultants come in and help us do a community profile um, and this at least in my time on council is one of the first times that we've been able to fund um, the entirety of or more than almost every single one of our grant requests um, only two had had less than their <coughs> recommendation um, so it, or, or for their request rather and so this is a really um, exciting thing to see move forward tonight um, and those are the, the only comments that I had this evening. All right, thank you. Um, any other comments before? No, she's right. Uh, this is a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and before we take a vote, I think uh, um, I would just like to, um, one, acknowledge um, that one Capitola uh, has had a decades-long history of support for community programs. You know, which means supporting our seniors, means supporting our youth, uh, supporting the low-income um, families that live in uh, our city, um, and supporting uh, this this disabled. Um, and I think it's important that we continue that tradition. Um, and it's important because it really creates the kind of community I think that we all want to live in. Um, it creates a better community. It, it assists our police force, our public safety. Um, and I think that these are all critical and essential safety net services. Um, and when times are hard, um, these are the folks that suffer the most. And so I would hope that we would keep that in mind um, and not um, kind of leave them behind um, as we're trying to circle the wagons and that we need to bring them in some fashion uh, through the good times and through the hard times. Um, they are our community partners. Um, they help and assist um, our residents um, and I think it's essential and important that we uh, maintain this tradition in Capitola. Uh, it's good for all of us. Um, uh, to do that. Now with that said, I would also encourage the council um, to check in with our partners more than once every three years. Um, you know, we used to have a process where th that the city manager mentioned that they would come um, maybe monthly. Um, that may have been a little bit too much, but I think that there should be um, uh, kind of invitations and having them report to us um, so that we can also feel that we're good stewards of the city's monies um, uh, and that we can um, have a dialogue and understand, um, you know, their importance to the community and that they are being transparent uh, and being accountable uh, to the council. I think that that's in the part of a good partnership. Um, so with that, you know, it's my honor to actually be able to um, vote on a community programs um, grant allocation. This is the beginning of a new process, and I'm sure it will evolve and, uh, and approve over the years. And so, yes, Council Member Bertrand? Yeah, um, so I echo, I think, everyone's comments. But um, having people come in here who are representing the programs that they work so much on, and it's usually a labor of love. I've been involved in senior council for well over 10 years or more. Now I'm on the advisory board because I'm elected here. Um, but one other aspect I think that's really important for us as board members here is to be familiar with the programs that we're funding. When we talk to our neighbors and people that 
sometimes we, we realize might need the help of some of those programs, like an elderly person, someone from Scout might help them do their taxes. Or NAMI, a parent that is dealing with a kid that is going through mental health issues. Um, it's great to hear that there's a new organization, excuse me, not an organization, a new effort of the Volunteer Center, which I've worked with many times. One of the programs I helped start is going to become a member of that pretty soon. But now that they're reaching out to kids that are being um, put on the street in some cases, they were, um, you know, they were part of a family that the government supported them to be um, part of, and now they're on the street. And I've had many experiences with kids that were in that situation and did not end up so well. So the reason why I'm talking this way is because these are programs that, in a sense, we are stewards of in a small way because we're doing part of the funding. But we could also be an ambassador to our city's residents that actually need these services. And um, one of the traditions of Capitol City Council members is we actually go out and talk to people in our city. We don't just do mailings and things like that. We actually talk with people, knock on doors. If you look at what's going on right now for the next election, I hear people say, I did 200 doors tonight. And he says, I'm going to do more tomorrow. I mean, this is our tradition. And when you make those connections, those people come back to you and ask for help sometimes. And some of the programs that we are funding helps provide that hope. So I think it's very important for us, not for people necessarily to come here because they want to inform us, but for us to know what we're actually funding and we're the stewards of those programs in a certain sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously, which will take us to item nine on this evening's agenda, which is adjournment. I will adjourn this meeting to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Capitola City Council on October 27th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in these chambers. and. Uh, Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone who's in person who came uh, this evening and everyone who uh, participated and listened out in Zoom. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Are we wearing Thank our you. costumes?